echo what Roger said, especially if you are visiting with us. We want you to know that you are our honored guest and hope that you will stick around for just a couple of minutes after services so we can introduce ourselves and get to know you just a little bit better. I hope that you have been made to feel welcome and appreciated. Uh, even though our number is small today, as Roger pointed out, we have quite a few uh, both on our traveling list and on our sick list. I was just doing a quick count in my head here. Um, I counted about 15 between those that are traveling uh, and those that are out sick of our normal folks that are uh, nor folks that are normally here. Uh, so um, hopefully we'll get everyone back soon. And uh, But we are glad that you are here and uh, out with us this morning. I saw this billboard uh, a while back the, down in Louisiana when we were visiting Kathy's folks and uh, it said check your offenders status and of course it's got this 1-800 number there and then the uh, website that you can uh, click on for that. What it is, it's, it's the Louisiana Automated Victim Notification System and that allows people who have been victims of violent crimes or of sex crimes uh, to be able to call this uh, number or go on this website and check where the person that has offended them uh, is, if they're still incarcerated, if they are um, getting out of jail, if they've moved uh, to a different area, especially in the case of uh, registered sex offenders. But it gives those victims the opportunity to check on the person that had done them wrong. Well, this got me to thinking about our attitude as Christians toward our offenders and the fact that we like to check on their status and I'm going to use this uh, as my lesson this morning and then uh, we'll close but I want us to think about this idea of offenders people who offend us now let's define this term first of all so we all understand what we're talking about what we're not talking about okay many of you probably won't be able to see it but from from where you're sitting from right up here I'm wearing my Alabama Crimson Tide tie Okay? Some of you may be offended by that, okay? uh, especially if you're the team that we beat 62 to 10 yesterday, all right? <clears throat> or if you are an Auburn fan, and if you are, my apologies to you okay, for being an Auburn fan. Uh, you need to come over to the light side, all right? Or if you're any of the other teams that in the last 10 or 12 years that we have just completely thrashed and run into the ground, okay? If you're a Tennessee fan, we'll have some counseling appointments available after services today, all right? Because your team is just horrible this year, all right? But that's not the kind of offense that I'm talking about, all right? We love to use this term offended, uh, especially in today's society. We get offended at every little thing, but not the way the Bible talks about, right? Okay? <clears throat> We get upset, and when we use the term offended today, we mean it just to say is we don't like something. Okay? If you're offended by my tie, it just means you don't like it. Okay? Uh, I had a guy come to me one time, and he was, you know, I'm, I'm offended by something. Well, well, what's going on? Well, I just don't like it. Okay, well, that's what you mean then. You just don't like it. That's not the kind of offense that the Bible talks about or that we want to talk about this morning. So let's define this term the way the Bible does. The word, the Greek word that's used in the New Testament, don't worry, we're not going to get real deep in the Greek here, but I just want to bring this up, okay? The Greek word that's translated offend, especially in the King James Version, is the Greek word and it's pronounced skandalizo. That's the, the Greek, if you could read Greek, uh, that's how you'd pronounce that right there. And it literally means to cause to sin. Uh, to offend someone in that way means to cause them to sin. It means to put a stumbling block or an impediment in the way upon which another may trip and fall. And you can probably see from the, the transliteration there, it's where we get our English word scandal. And if you think about that word and what it means, you can understand how these two are connected. You know, when we say something is a, a scandal, okay, uh, that's an action or an event regarded as morally or legally wrong and causing general public outrage. Okay? That's where we get that word scandal from. Well, the biblical usage, again, means causing someone to sin or even sinning against someone. Look at this passage here from Matthew chapter 5, verses 29 through 30. If your right eye causes you to sin, if you've got an older translation, it may say offends you. Okay? That's what we're talking about here. If it causes you to sin, Jesus says tear it out and throw it away. 
For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, again, that word scandalizo, stumble, offends, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Uh, a couple other passages, Romans chapter 14, verses 13 and 21, Paul writes there, Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block, scandalizo, or hindrance in the way of a brother. Then verse 21, it is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. And then one more passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 9 and 13, but take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. You, you see the difference here, don't you? Okay. The way the Bible talks about offending somebody okay, or, or being an offense is to cause them to sin, to make them stumble in their walk with Christ. Because there's going to be a lot of things that happen within the Christian body, within the body of Christ, that we're not going to like about one another. Again, you may not like my tie. I may not like the shirt you're wearing. I may not like your hairstyle. It offends me. Okay, That's not the type of offense we're talking about this morning. And it's not the way the Bible uses it. In fact, the way the Bible uses it is a lot more uh, serious. It needs to be taken a lot more serious than just whether or not we don't like somebody's sports team or not. So an offender, the way the Bible uses it, would therefore be anyone who sins against us, causing us to stumble in our faith. Now that we've gotten that definition out of the way, how do we treat our offenders? Because I'm sure if you stop and think about it in your life, you have been offended, using the biblical definition, at some point in your life. Someone has done something that has caused you to stumble or to sin. So how do we treat them? Well, how we should treat them, number one, is to forgive them. The Bible is very clear that we are to forgive people who sin against us, who cause us to stumble, who offend us in that way. Luke chapter 17, verses 3 and 4, Jesus says, Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. I'm going to come back to that number seven here in just a moment, but just as a reminder, <coughs> it was Jewish tradition, tradition only, that if someone sinned against you with the same offense, you forgave them three times, and after three, you were not required to forgive them anymore. Again, that was their tradition. Jesus says here, if they come against you seven times, which in the Bible, seven uh, represents uh, an entirety, a completeness. He says, seven times in one day, you forgive him seven times. There's a more familiar passage in Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 and 22. Peter came up to Jesus and said, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Peter here is thinking, I'm being generous. I'm going beyond the three that the elders say, the traditions say. I'm doubling it and adding one more. Seven times, Lord. That's good, right? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times, or 70 times seven as some versions read there. Jesus is teaching we continually forgive. There's no limit to the forgiveness that we are to offer our brother. If they repent, if they come to us and ask for forgiveness, we don't cut them off at a certain amount. We don't say, look, I've had it. You, you, you keep doing this. You keep stumbling. And yeah, you keep asking me for forgiveness. I'm not forgiving you anymore. What if God treated us that way? Hold that thought. We'll come back to it in just a moment. See, the Bible teaches us that not only are we to forgive, but we are to forgive as we've been forgiven. If you open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18, Jesus teaches a very important parable there. We won't take time to read the whole thing. <clears throat> we'll look at a few passages there. Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 21. In fact, this is the very passage we just read where Peter has asked, how many times should I forgive? And then he goes on to tell this parable about a man who owed 10,000 talents. We've talked about that before, what that amount represented. If we were to convert that, if these are gold talents and we convert um, 
the weight of that gold into today's money using today's gold prices, we're talking about an amount in the billions with a B, billions of dollars that this man owed. In other words, Jesus is saying here, it's an amount that could not be repaid. Uh, more than likely in this parable, Jesus is talking about uh, probably a, a king and one of his, his finance minister, and he has squandered away the country's entire um, uh, reserves here. And he owes this amount. And so he goes to the master and he begs for forgiveness after the master has said that his wife and children are to be sold into slavery and everything he has to be sold to pay the debt. He begs for forgiveness. And this master forgives him everything. Verse 27, the master of that slave had compassion, released him, and forgave him the loan. But then that slave, verse 28, went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii which is about 100 days' wages. He grabbed him, started choking him, and said, Pay what you owe. <coughs> At this, his fellow slave fell down and began begging him, Be patient with me, and I will pay you back. Almost the very same thing that he had said to his master. But verse 30 says he wasn't willing. On the contrary, he went away and threw him into, pr he went and threw him into prison until he could pay what was owed. When the other slaves saw what had taken place, they were deeply distressed and went and reported to their master everything that had happened. Now here's where it really comes down to us, verse 32. Then after he had summoned him, his master said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Shouldn't you also have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? Jesus says, We are to forgive as we have been forgiven. We have been given, forgiven a tremendous amount. We are like the man that owed the 10,000 talents, a debt that we cannot repay. We have sinned against God and there's nothing we can do to get rid of that debt. And yet God has forgiven it. But we turn around like that slave and we go to someone who has offended us. And maybe it's a legitimate offense. Maybe they've put a stumbling block in a way. Maybe they've done something wrong to us. And they ask us for forgiveness and we are unwilling because we're not stopping and thinking about what we've been forgiven. What God has done for us. We need to forgive as we have been forgiven. And then thirdly, we need to forgive so that we can be forgiven. Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15 say, For if, you're, if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And then Mark 11 and verse 25, And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Forgiveness is important in the Bible. It's important in our Christian lives. We have been forgiven we need to be forgiving as we've been forgiven, and we need to forgive so that God will forgive us. That's the way that it should be. But when it comes to our offenders, what do we actually do? I think we do like this billboard advertises. We check our offenders' status all the time. Well, when Kathy asked me what I was going to be preaching about this morning, I told her, she's like, oh, you mean like on Facebook? And it didn't even occur to me. <laughs> but yeah, we do that, don't we? It's like going on Facebook and we're checking and seeing, what are they doing? What are they up to? But when we're checking our offender status, we're not seeing if they're doing okay. In our minds, we want to know, are they keeping their nose clean? Are they still remorseful for what they've done? Are they still feeling guilt? Are they still being punished? Are they going to do this to me again? You see, we haven't truly forgiven when we're checking our offender status in that way. When we're looking to make sure, especially those last two things there that I mentioned, are they still being punished? Because as we've been talking about in our Sunday morning class, we want justice. We want punishment for people who have done wrong. But when it comes to us, we want mercy and forgiveness and grace. We can't have it both ways. If we want mercy and forgiveness and grace, like we just talked about, we have to be willing to forgive as well. But I think more importantly, we act this way. We check our offender status because we're worried that they're going to do this to us again. Basically, we're talking about the fact that trust has been broken. We've been hurt. 
and we don't want it to happen again. Someone has done something to us, and we want to make sure that they don't have the opportunity to hurt us again. And so we put up a, a barrier. We put up a defense mechanism. And we often view them as our enemy, especially if they're not fellow Christians. But even when they are Christians, sometimes we still treat them as our enemies. But you know what? The Bible tells us how we're to treat our enemies, doesn't it? Romans chapter 12, verses 20 and 21. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We are to treat our enemies like we treat our friends. We're to show kindness to them. We're to show compassion to them. We're to be forgiving to them. You've probably heard this one before, but the couple went into the preacher for marriage counseling and they were just, I mean, constantly going at it with one another. And the preacher finally uh, asked the woman, and, and referring to this verse, he said, well, have you done like in Romans? Have you herped, heaped burning coals on his head? She said, no, I dumped a hot pot of hot coffee on him one time. That just made him even madder. That's not what the Bible's talking about here, okay? Heaping burning coals on someone's head, it's going to turn it upside down for them. They're going to expect to be treated with hatred, with maliciousness. But when we treat them with kindness and compassion, they're not going to know what to do. That's where the phrase comes from, kill them with kindness. In Romans also, verse, chapter 12 and verse 19, we read, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. See, that's what we want when we're checking our offender status in this way. We're wanting them to be punished. We're wanting them to get what they deserve for what they've done to us. The Bible says, look, leave that to God. Don't worry about uh, executing judgment on them, about punishing them. If they're in the wrong and they're not repentant, guess what? God's going to handle that. Now, it may not be here on the earth. It may be in the afterlife. But God deals with punishment and with justice. But again... If we stop for a moment and put ourselves in their shoes, do we want the justice that we deserve for what we have done? Do we want the punishment that we deserve? If not, then we shouldn't want that for others either. And I think what this all boils down to is it boils down to the fact that we haven't learned to love like the Bible tells us to love. Again, going to the book of Romans, chapter 14 and verse 15. For if your brother is hurt by what you eat, you are no longer walking according to love. By what you eat, do not destroy that one for whom Christ died. This is that passage where Paul's talking about, won't eat meat if it, if it offends my brother, if it causes him to stumble. They had a right to do it, but Paul says, look, you may have a right to do this, but if it's going to hurt your brother or sister, if it's going to cause them to stumble, you know what? Don't do it. If you're doing that, you're not walking according to love. And then in that famous passage on love, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, it says, Love does not act improperly. It is not selfish. It is not provoked. No, it does not keep a record of wrongs. Checking your offender status, trying to see if they're still you know, remorseful, still feeling guilty, still being punished. That's keeping a record of some wrong that's done to you. We need to learn to let it go. And I know that's easier said than done. I know it's easier for me to stand up here and say, just let it go, and it's a whole lot harder to do in real life. Trust me, I know. I've had things done to me that it's been very hard to let go of. And there's still some things that I struggle with. But that's what we have to do. We have to try to let go of those things, to not keep a record of wrong, to forgive as we have been forgiven. Because... God loves us and forgives us that way. Romans chapter 4, verses 7 through 8. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. And he's quoting Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2 right there. The only way that we really should be checking our offender's status is to see if we have truly forgiven them. We should follow Romans chapter 12, verses 20 through 21, which we just read. I'm not going to go back and read it again, but if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. 
We need to ask ourselves, what if God was treating me the way that I'm treating and fill in the blank there? What if God treated me that way? What if, what if God was constantly checking on my status? Seeing if I'm still being punished. Seeing if I'm still remorseful. Seeing if I'm still suffering the consequences of my sin. That's how we treat one another. What if God acted that way toward us? Aren't you glad that He doesn't? You see, God forgives us completely. He wipes it away and He remembers it no more. We need to forgive and God wants to forgive us. And so this morning I encourage you, forgive the way you're supposed to. Don't check your offender's status constantly. Let God handle any punishment, any justice that might be due, but love them, forgive them as best you can, and go on with your life because you have been forgiven of so much. This morning, if you're here, you need to respond to the invitation of Jesus Christ. If you need to become a Christian, being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, I encourage you to do that. If you've done that in the past and have wandered away, you need to make things right. If you need prayers for strength or for encouragement, whatever your need would be, we invite you to come and respond. As together we stand and sing.